There hasn't been nearly enough research or conversation about women's health, especially when it comes to metabolic health. Most of the research on keto diet has been on men. If it's not working for you, it's not because somehow there's something wrong with your body. It's simply that diet has not been well researched in women and really neither has intermittent fasting. And so we're dealing with two modalities that many men find a lot of success with. Um, and women, the experience has been more varied. And my hope is that whether through levels or other researchers that we start to understand, well, what would, what would keto be for women specifically? And my guess is that whatever that ends up being, if a man followed that, he might say, wow, there's something wrong with my body because this isn't working for right. me. Switching the framing, I think, uh, really puts into perspective how difficult it is for women to try to follow male-centric tools. To your point, there's not enough out there on this topic. And um, anytime I see a podcast about the different phases of the menstrual cycle, what's happening to our bodies, I always listen because I'm so I'm so interested in it personally. So I wanted to focus the conversation on on that today. Like what's happening to our bodies? Um, I recently learned that your menstrual cycle is not just the week that you're getting your period. So I, I'd love to start there. Yeah. So the menstrual cycle, I think as you pointed out, the most famous part of it is actual menstruation, which is when bleeding is occurring. And I think a lot of people think of that as your period or as the entire menstrual cycle, but there's actually four chapters. And, and of course you can think of the cycle amongst as many different types of chapters you want, but often there's four that are talked about. And um, probably as our audience knows, but the menstrual cycle is the body's process for women of reproductive age typically to get ready to potentially have a pregnancy. But of course, many women choose not to be pregnant or are not pregnant in their lifetimes. And the menstrual cycle is still occurring. And really, it's just as meaningful. There's all kinds of hormonal changes happening every month throughout the month. The first thing I think that's important for people to know is that what we're going to talk about is a kind of typical 28-day cycle. But some women have cycles that are less or more days. And of course, there's a range that's considered kind of the normal range. And then there's people, of course, who have cycles outside of that range too. And those sometimes are linked to different conditions or different imbalances hormonally. And, and some of those are actually really specifically linked to insulin resistance and metabolic health which will be the topic of a whole other doc talk, but for example, like polycystic ovarian syndrome, where you can see cycles being shorter than a month or much, much longer than a month. Anyway, so that's the preface. The four main phases. The first phase is exactly what you said, which is menstruation itself. This is when you are shedding the uterine lining. The body has decided that there is no pregnancy and it is Kind of dropping hormone levels down to baseline and really preparing for another cycle of potential pregnancy. Um, so we say that menstruation is the first one to five days or so. And I think as a lot of women have experienced, it's not exactly five days. Um, it can really vary, but that's the first chunk of the menstrual cycle is menstruation itself. I have heard some people say that they feel the worst during that phase. And then some people feel the worst during other phases, worse meaning lower energy levels or just lethargic, that fluctuates. And maybe it would make sense to go through each phase first, but that fluctuates just based on person to person. Um, or does that have to do kind of with insulin resistance, metabolic health, how you're feeling your body? Both. And I think this goes back to the way we started this conversation, which is unfortunately, there really hasn't been nearly enough research on the menstrual cycle, even separately from metabolic health, just the menstrual cycle in general. For example, I think a lot of women talk about having cramps. The amount of research that has gone into understanding that, how to prevent those or how to modify them, really is just barely any research at all within the scope of how many research dollars have gone into other things and, and other areas. So I think this is something that I hope changes, but that's just something to point out that a lot of this stuff, we really are scratching the surface when you when you think about the fact that half of the population at, a different, right. at certain chapters in their life, more or less, is experiencing this. So, um, but the short answer to your question, and we can go through each phase, is that hormone levels are at their lowest during menstruation. And so many women will feel that drop in hormone level that happens during menstruation. But to your point, I also think it's a lot of, there's a lot of personalization here. And I think even women have experienced, I know I've certainly experienced that sometimes one month will be different than another month. And so there's even variation within the same person. Totally. Okay. 
On to stage two. Stage two is the follicular phase. During this phase, the body is basically preparing an egg for ovulation to potentially meet a sperm and be fertilized. Um, but what's happening hormonally during this phase is that estrogen is beginning to climb and ultimately peaks right around the time of ovulation. So this is a time when the body is really using a lot of energy to prepare for what's coming. Um, and we'll come back to what this means for metabolic health. But I'll just, I'll kind of finish the phases and then we'll go into each one more deeply. Perfect. So from the follicular phase, you can think of that as about day five through day 14. So it's after bleeding stops until ovulation. Ovulation is phase three. Ovulation is when the egg is actually released from the ovary and becomes available for fertilization. And I should say again, I'm, I'm describing these phases within the context of pregnancy but it's really important to note that this is not just about pregnancy. This is the rhythm sure. that all, almost all reproductive age women <laughs> have happening in their bodies every month, regardless of pregnancy. So I think actually the fact that we frame as a medical community often the menstrual cycle in terms of pregnancy, we have some work to do there. And um, next time I talk about this, I hope that I will phrase it a little bit differently, but this is the standard way of thinking about it. So ovulation is when the egg is released. Um, it coincides with the spike in several hormones, in including, like I said, estrogen tends to be at its peak right around ovulation. The final phase is the luteal phase. And this is when the egg is available for fertilization. It's either fertilized or not. If it's fertilized, you go into a whole different process of pregnancy or potential pregnancy. If it's not, which is what we're talking about, then the body ultimately prepares to shed the lining and to start again. But while it's kind of preparing potentially for pregnancy and um, implantation, the hormone levels also change. And specifically, progesterone rises and kind of peaks out during the luteal phase. Um, and as you get towards the very late part of the luteal phase, progesterone and estrogen start to drop again, and we start over with menstruation. Super interesting. I, I have personally felt lowest energy levels and just kind of that blah feeling of not wanting to do anything like lack of energy um not feeling as interested in things that i'd normally be interested in like hanging out with friends i'm just oh, i'd rather just have a movie day today right before um menstruation so during that luteal phase um is that and i've heard on some podcasts and other sources say um your body is potentially preparing yourself for a pregnancy during that phase. It's true that your body is potentially preparing for a pregnancy. And I think that process can use a lot of energy and it changes the kind of hormonal signaling that's happening in your body. Maybe this is a good moment actually to talk about metabolic health and how that might be influencing energy and some of the things that you're describing. So estrogen in general, and these are generalizations. And again, really, really, we need more research on this, but in general, it's believed that estrogen is connected with higher levels of insulin sensitivity, which is to say lower levels of insulin resistance and a better ability to tolerate carbs. Um, and progesterone is the opposite. It's associated with lower levels of insulin sensitivity, higher levels of insulin resistance, and less ability to tolerate carbs. And yet, when progesterone is the primary hormonal signal, there's also more of a carb craving. And again, this probably links evolutionarily to something connected to what the body is craving in relation to preparing for pregnancy and implantation. But what this means in terms of the cycle is that the first half of the cycle, which is the um, follicular phase, we said that estrogen peaks. So estrogen, we can think of as the kind of primary hormonal signal during that phase. And then in the second half, the follicular phase, progesterone is peaking. And so we can think of progesterone as the primary hormonal signal during that phase. And so what this means, broadly speaking, is that during the first half of your cycle, you are in a position to tolerate carb loads better and at the same time maybe craving carbs less. And yet in the follicular side, there's been a lot of um, research, well, by a lot, it's relative. There's been some research within the realm of relative to the kind of the research in this area showing that women during the second half of their cycles when progesterone is the primary signal actually crave carbs more, but can handle them less well. So for example, there was an observational study looking at women, what they called in the wild, which is just to say living their normal lives. And the amount of consumption of carbs and processed carbs actually more than doubled 
during that second half of the cycle. Wow. Right. And as we know from many of the other doc talks, when you have insulin resistance, high carb loads, glucose instability, you are going to feel fatigue. You are going to feel the brain fog, all these things that are linked to the metabolic dysfunction with or without menstrual cycle. Interesting. There's a chance that our hormones are kind of leading us to not take as good care of our bodies, like those cravings and maybe being lethargic. You might not be exercising as much anymore um, during that phase. And then maybe that actually in turn has to do with how we're feeling. It's just that cycle that we always see. Um, if you're not taking care of your body and eating higher carb meals and not moving as much, you're not going to feel as good. Um, so that could also be just a matter of the way that we're feeling ourselves during that time. Exactly. And the other hormone that we haven't talked about yet, and probably we could do a whole nother episode on other hormones that are occurring during the menstrual cycle, because estro estrogen and progesterone are just two of them. But one that's kind of important for this conversation is testosterone. And I think people tend to think of that as a male hormone, but it's actually the most abundant hormone in the female body. And women's bodies are really, really sensitive to testosterone. Testosterone is also changing throughout the menstrual cycle, and specifically, it peaks right around ovulation. And so some women will describe that they actually feel like they have the most energy around ovulation, so say around days 13 to 15. And some experts, like our advisor, Sarah Gottfried, talks about timing of stress on the body. So specifically, like if you want to do a really high-intensity workout, or you're thinking about doing fasting or some other form of stress on the body, that you can take advantage of that period, say day nine through 14, when testosterone is, is increasing, estrogen is increasing, and you're moving towards ovulation. The thinking is that your body will be best able to kind of adapt to that stress and grow from it. Um, and it might be just easiest psychologically to do it, right? Like if you're craving a ton of carbs at the end of your cycle and you're trying to carb restrict, that is going to be a very difficult challenge. And you might want to time it so that you're doing that carb restriction at a time when your body's a little bit less likely for that to feel painful. If we're craving carbs or I crave chocolate, something sweet typically in different phases of my menstrual cycle, wh what do you do personally even when if you ever experience cravings and how do you kind of manage that yourself? I'll give you my personal experience because again, I think there, there certainly are probably people researching this, but it's not super well established, um, at least not research that I've seen. There's a few things here. One is that in general, I tend to think that when your body's telling you something, it that's a signal that I try to respect. So my approach is to what you said, which is I try to satisfy cravings in the healthiest way possible. That actually starts well before we even talk about food. It starts with good sleep and it starts with low stress and with exercise. So that you're not in a situation where you're so low sleep and your cortisol levels are so high that you really don't have, at least for me, I don't really have the mental functioning to be thinking to myself, well, I crave X, so therefore I'm going to make this strategic decision. I'm much more able to do that when I'm well rested, I'm not stressed, I'm moving. And when basically I've planned, you know, I don't know if you experienced this, but planning goes a really long way and it's easiest to plan when you have all those other pieces I put in place. Um, and I think it's important to, to talk about the fact that having those things in place does reflect quite a bit of privilege in terms of day-to-day -day life. The vast majority of people may not have the option to have all of those pieces in place. You know, if you have kids at home, if you have multiple jobs, if you have all kinds of things, there's constraints on your ability to control your sleep, to control your stress, to control these other things. So I think that's something important to note. And I would just say that then it's trying to get as far along those things as you can realistically, um, knowing that everything is connected, essentially. But and within that, something that I really want to help women and men <laughs> for things that impact men more specifically, but women feel like is that they have tools to make small changes, even if they can't become the most optimized person for a variety of reasons. And I think there's so much that we can do that are little things that would still make a difference in terms of how we feel, for example, right before menstruation. Right. Like these things can, we can make tweaks that I think can help. PMSing is not just the way you're acting or the way you're feeling and <laughs> emotionally. Um, but people kind of talk about it in that way. Where does that come from? And how do hormones play into just the way you're feeling, acting, um, thinking, um, that kind of stuff? I think there's a lot to talk about here. And we should probably do an entire episode on PMS. I think that would be interesting. Totally. I'll just say some things that come to mind. Um, 
I think that one of the things that people talk about the most is what you mentioned, which is basically PMS. Um, and if we think about that phase, and that's specifically essentially, say, the five to 10 days before menstruation. So the official term for it would probably be the late luteal phase. Call it days 20 through 28 of your cycle. And during that time, progesterone, as we know, is starting to peak. Progesterone is associated with all kinds of things. In, in addition to lower levels of insulin sensitivity, it's also connected with, for example, water retention. And I think as many women have experienced, and I've certainly experienced, you begin to feel that water retention growing and is some bloating? Women, bloating or okay. just feeling fat, I think, which is a term yeah. that, we probably, that we probably don't want to continue to, to kind of use. Um, but this feeling that your body's changing and that there's, it, it doesn't feel as good as it, as it normally would potentially. Totally. Um, and I think there's so much psychology linked to that as well. Then as you get closer to menstruation, both estrogen and progesterone start to drop off. So then you start to feel this real letdown in hormones. And that also has ties to the psychology and mood and how it feels to just drop off those hormones. In society, there's been so much time where it's almost expected that a woman should feel the same all month long. And if she's experiencing anything different, it's like she's moody or she's whatever. And I think what you said is what's so true, which is actually there's major changes happening in the body all month long. And those are linked to people's moods in different ways. And I, I think we should come back to this because I actually want to refresh on the, the research related to, for example, estrogen and its connection to mood. And then as we transition into progesterone. But I do think overall, it's what you said, which is knowing that there's actually things happening. It's not just that you're, you're moody. Your body is undergoing changes. This is true in pregnancy. This is true in menopause. This is true even outside of these kind of defined moments that we recognize as a, as a society or hormonal shifts. Even just as you transition from 30 to 40, from 40 to 50, throughout your lifespan, as you change your lifestyle, your diet, the stressors in your life, like you said, your hormonal balance is changing. And um, I think if anything, the overall theme of all of this is that hormonal balance is so complex and it's fragile in some ways. Of course, the body is amazingly resilient, but there's so many things that can knock that hormonal balance off. And when one piece goes off, everything starts to get a little bit less smooth. And so there's just, I think it's incredible, but you know, thyroid function is related to this. Sex drive is related to this. Mood is related to this. Feelings of confidence even have been shown to have connections to the different phases of the menstrual cycle and in relation to testosterone and also in relation to testosterone as it may get lowered from life stressors. So that's a whining answer to your question, but I think there's so many things happening at once that certainly there is actual physiologic change happening and there is actual, actual psychologic change happening. And those are essentially one and the same in my mind. Taking care of your body is so much easier said than done. And when our bodies are feeling kind of the worst overall, I'll say, is when we should be paying the most attention to it. Yeah. And, and I think one way of thinking about that kind of in an optimistic sense is that it's a time when small decisions and changes can have a huge impact. So you can almost view totally. it as, as right, like a high impact time. So every little thing you do is in some ways really valuable. And I think um, because to the extent, like you said, we, we know we're in a situation where our insulin resistance is probably higher. So that doesn't mean that we eat no carbs, right? Like we don't want to make our lives as absolutely difficult as possible, but it's what you said, which is using the strategies that we know work to just try to make life as easy on our bodies as possible in terms of not loading it with huge carb loads or having a small amount of high fiber carb like a small amount of berries, let's say, and then going for a walk. And hopefully you're pairing those berries with fat and protein and all the strategies that we talk about in our other talks, um, but just really putting those into place and, and I think just celebrating the fact that you're helping your body. <laughs>